Let's continue on from the previous video, particularly that idea of uh, the foundation of the chart. We've talked about how the sun is the foundation of that initial impulse of the soul, the intelligence of pure consciousness coming into the world, and that the moon is the reflection of that light, how that light interacts with uh, the relative realms, which is the soul as we typically think of it, the jiva. We also need to consider the ascendant. And as I mentioned in previously, the sun represents the causal aspect of our being, our causal body. The moon represents the astral body, the level of emotions and memories, um, connections, energetic flows and such that define who we are and how we relate to the world and how the planets impact us because they are also transmitters of astral force. They are astral beings. And the ascendant is the representation of the physical form. So once it comes down from causal to astral to physical, then what? And that is the actual, the ascendant is the actual vessel which um, through which all of this is working. And the ascendant sets the stage for how all the planets are going to function. It sets the stage for the particular areas of life that each planet rules. And it shows us why someone born two hours different from you, or even an hour different, sometimes even a minute different, uh, can have an extremely different life than you, because maybe they were born at that time when there was a shift between the ascendant changing from, say, Cancer to Leo, or any other particular sign. The ascendant itself is the point on the horizon, the constellation on the horizon, maybe constellation isn't the right word, there we are, the sign on the horizon, that was rising the moment you were born. So just like the sun rises, um, ascendants rise as well. So that moment you were born, the sign that was rising just like the sun rises is your ascendant, your ascendant sign. Sets the foundation for the rest of the chart. Now, if we have a Cancer ascendant, for example, and now we have the moon ruling the first house because cancer is ruled by the moon and that moon is placed in the ninth house well that's going to push our consciousness in a certain direction ninth house can get us involved in all sorts of things such as uh, teaching law ethics morals dharma all these things ninth house related things but now let's say a person was born uh, on that same day except now they are a Leo ascendant, so Leo was rising when they were born. Now the sun becomes the ruler of the ascendant, and wherever that sun goes, it's going to show us what is the primary focus, the primary direction of the person's life in regards to the house that it rules. So as we get to the houses, you'll understand what I mean by this, but each house represents something specific and different. Whereas one person might have their ascendant lord in the twelfth house, which will give more behind the scenes contemplative work or even possibly working in a warehouse, because that can be ruled by the, the 12th, um, to having their Ascendant Lord being placed in um, uh, the 5th, which can get them involved with children, creativity, other 5th house affairs, um, speculative investments. So this is why the Ascendant is so important, because it will change what we see between one person and another, even if they were born on the same day. and. This is why um, it's not useful to necessarily look at sun signs, like in newspapers, or predictions based on sun signs, because the sun changes signs every 30 days, which means anyone born in that same time period, 30-day time period, um, will have the same sun sign as you. And so that's very broad. We can get some information, general information, but not specific. The moon changes every two and a quarter days, or thereabouts. And that's more specific than the sun, but less specific than the ascendant, which changes every two hours. So we can see that in order of importance, when we're looking at the specifics of a chart, sun is third, moon is second, ascendant is first. We need them all, but in regards to the specifics, the ascendant is most helpful. Now, this brings us to the idea of benefic and malefic planets, and there are some ways to consider that. There are the general ideas of what's a benefic and what's a malefic planet, and then there are the benefic and malefic planets specific to the person's ascendant, so it's different for everyone. 
But first, let's talk about the the uh, benefics and malefics that are the same for everyone. Now, benefic means gentle, kind, gives things easily, doesn't make you work for it, typically. The benefic planets uh, are Jupiter, Venus, Mercury, when he's not with a malefic. So Mercury acts like any planet he's with. So if he's by himself, he's a benefic. If he's with a benefic, he's a benefic. If he's closer to a malefic in the same sign, closer to a malefic, he acts malefic. And we'll discuss this in a minute. So Jupiter, Venus, Mercury, and the, um, the waxing moon. That means the moon as it's going towards full. Once the moon starts going uh, towards new, it becomes a malefic. It's the waning moon. Standard malefics are Saturn, Mars, the Sun, Rahu, and Ketu. And again, Mercury, when he's with a malefic, another malefic, and the moon, when it's waning. Now the Sun, um, since it is our indicator of self for everyone, um, it's still considered a malefic, but in my experience, less so, because it, it does represent us and our soul nature. It depends on the house that it rules, too. But the sun, I would consider that more of a minor malefic. The more intense malefics are Rahu, K2, Saturn, and Mars. And what does that mean, malefic and benefic? Well, benefic planets give things, meaning that if you have Jupiter influencing the 10th house, and it's in a good dignity, it's supported in other ways, that 10th house affairs, fame, career, ability to impact the world, it'll happen more naturally. So wherever these benefic planets are placed, it brings more ease in regards to manifesting those things, generally speaking. Malefics bring more stress and strain, which is why they're considered malefics because you have to work hard to get good things um, from their energy. They don't just give it to you, they make you earn it. And we have to remember that in regards to planets, we need all of the planets. We need Jupiter, Venus, Mercury, Saturn, Mars, Rahu, Ketu, so there's not, we don't want to get rid of any of them. Because Saturn is a malefic. He helps us endure. He helps us do the tedious things to be successful and great in life. He keeps us from getting bored, allows us to move through difficult situations. We need that. If we don't have it, we'll crumple very easily when bad things come along or difficult situations arise. So you see, he has a, a good side and a bad side. When Saturn is weak, bad dignity, um, getting hurt, Lajitati of Ashtas. And the Lajitati of Ashes, again, that's a, a course that I've already done. It's available on my website as an MP3 download. Then what happens? Well, then Saturn, he can't work hard. He's lazy. He doesn't understand what it takes to be successful in the world. When hardship comes along, he just gives up and says, Oh, I can't handle this. I can't deal with it. That's when Saturn is, is in a bad state. When Saturn is exalted, Mulatrakona, own home, um, supported by friends, uh, bad things come along and he deals with them and he moves on. He doesn't make a big deal about it. And this is why um, Saturn is considered to be such a difficult planet. Because most people don't want to understand that they have to work hard to get good things in life. And that's what Saturn represents, our capacity to do that, to endure, to make things work. And when people go through Sadi Sati periods or Saturn periods, what makes them worse is when Saturn is difficult within the birth chart, because then they can't handle the stress. If Saturn is in a really great state by house placement or dignity, it can be very hard during those periods, but the gains that someone gets or the way someone moves forward and builds themselves up and really accomplishes a lot in life, um, that can come from Saturn. So we don't want to be black and white about this. The one is terrible, uh, the other is good. The same thing with Jupiter. Jupiter is a benefic planet. He gives things to you freely. He wants you to be happy. He forgives, um, he supports. But when Jupiter is in bad situation, bad dignity, bad house, um, difficult logitati of Ashtas, he might think things are supposed to come too easy. Uh, he might trust his luck too much. 
he might think that opportunities are supposed to work out better than they are. So we can see that Jupiter is a benefic. I mean, he can give good, but when he's not well disposed, um, he still causes problems. So all of these planets, whether they're benefic or malefic, they can work well for you or they can work poorly for you. The malefics, Saturn, Mars, um, Rahu, K2, you, you have to earn it. You will have to buckle down and make it work. With um, benefics, they typically just give. It just happens naturally. Again, that's if they're in good dignity. So keep this in mind when you're thinking about benefics and malefics, that they all have a role to play. And you'll see what those roles are as we get more specifically into the planets, which are coming up um, about two or three videos from now. We're going to do uh, a segment on each of the planets. But let's take a moment to look at this, um, these tables over on the side of the screen here. This helps us to also see that friendly planets or helpful planets are dependent on the Ascendant. So if we see in this upper table, we have the signs. So there's uh, Aries, there's Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, and so on around. And within, within each of the signs, um, you'll find the planets that support this Ascendant, generally speaking. Meaning they're going to support the path, the Dharma, the ability to be successful. In this bottom table here, by sign, we'll see the plants that will have more capacity to get in the way of success. Again, just as a baseline. So they're not necessarily going to support the Dharma. Um, we'll consider this more possibly in a later series because this is going to get us involved with the, the yoga karakas and that is um, a little more complex than some people uh, use and we can use some math to help sort of determine just how strong a a raja yoga is where the yoga karakas are but for now let's just focus on this so if we see here we see that aries the friendly planets are sun moon mars and jupiter why is that well it's because these are planets that rule angles and trines. Uh, these are signs that help us mostly, angles and trines. So um, it's not across the board. But let's look. So with the sun, one, two, three, four, five. Well, the sun rules the fifth house from Aries, which is a trine. The moon rules the fourth house from Aries, which is an angle. Mars rules the first house. And any plant that rules the Ascendant in the first house is typically considered helpful, even though he does rule the eighth, since he rules the first that is helpful. Jupiter rules the ninth, which is a, one of the more powerful trines. So these are the friendly planets. Now we go down here, and we take a look at the planets that might be getting in the way of the person's dharma, or might be considered functional malefics. Is that the right term? Yeah, we'll go with it for now. So here, from Aries, we have Mercury ruling the third house, a house of effort, that you really have to work to make things happen, not an easy house. It rules the sixth, a house of delays and debts and paying off um, old karmas. We have Venus ruling the second, which is a killer house, a Marika house. Um, ruling the seventh, which is also a killer, a Marika house. This is a house of responsibilities, um, the second house is. And Saturn, <coughs> it rules the tenth, that is an angle. So in some situations, Saturn can be helpful. But Saturn also rules the 11th, which is one of the most powerful houses that gets in the way of um, allowing a person to meet their dharma and express what they meant to come here to express. Because the 11th, the 11th, the 3rd, uh, the 11th and the 3rd and the 6th houses, these are things that get in the way. Uh, the 11th can be personal desires or the uh, draw towards being recognized. And what we have to remember is that when it comes to planets and how they interact with the birth chart, that they are meant to support our path. Our path might not be to be famous and well-known and recognized. It might be to serve in a particular way where no one knows who we are. It might be to do a certain kind of work. And that's, that's what makes a person great not being well known, not being famous, but doing their work well. This is a Vedic science, correct? Well, from the Bhagavad Gita, there is that idea that the yogi is entitled to action only, not the fruits of their action. So we are here to do what we know how to do best, what our skill sets are best, and that's what the chart represents. 
and if fame, if um, people taking notice of us come from that, that's secondary. It happens, no problem. But our main goal is to do what we are here to do best. And so when we're looking at this friendly planets by sign, these are all planets for each ascendant that are going to help us, for the most part, accomplish that goal. And these planets, enemy planets by sign down here in the bottom, are going to be planets that on some level are going to get in the way of those goals. We're not going to go through them all. You can um, pause this video and study this chart. Or you can get the book, The Art and Science of Vedic Astrology. Um, I forget what chapter I got this from. Let's see. I believe it was chapter 9. Yeah, The Art and Science of Vedic Astrology, um, chapter 9, the very end on page 109. This chart is there, and the whole chapter speaks to this. So you can get that and study it. We'll take one more example here. Um, let's look at uh, let's look at a Libra ascendant. Well, for a Libra ascendant, we see that the Sun can be a difficult planet. Why? Because the Sun rules the eleventh house from Libra. Again, that's the primary uh, Raj Yoga breaker, obstacle builder. Um, we see that Mars rules the second and the seventh. Again, Mark are killer houses. We see that Jupiter rules the third and the sixth houses that give extra effort, debts, delays, suffering. So this is how we can start to understand, number one, the planets themselves, their benefic and malefic nature, but also um, how it's different for each ascendant. Whereas Saturn is excellent, um, Saturn can be excellent for a Libra ascendant. Saturn's going to be problematic for a Scorpio ascendant. Whereas Mars is excellent for an Aries ascendant, Mars will cause some problems for a Capricorn ascendant. And this is where we start to see the complexities of there's not just a black or white. There's not just these planets are this way, and that's how we're going to look at them, and that's going to be it. It's different on a case-by-case -case basis. So start considering this, and as we get into the uh, planets themselves, we'll talk about what does it mean when the sun is a malefic? What does it mean when the sun is helpful? What does it mean when Jupiter um, acts difficult? What does it mean when Jupiter is acting strong and positive? It's all going to be dependent on their dignity and their house placements. Okay, so hopefully you've enjoyed this portion. Uh, next up, we will be looking at uh, the gender and the strengths of planets. And after that video, after that lecture, we'll start with the Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, and go on through each of the planets, discussing what they represent um, and how you can use them to get more information from a person's chart. Thank you.